record on this computer. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we'll just give it a few more minutes and we can start maybe at two past uh, as people are, are coming in. And as I was kind of explaining, um, we'll just go through some introductory uh, talking points um, and then we'll be taking questions throughout the, the, the panel discussion in the chat box. Um, so people can ask away. Um, okay. Okay. How's everyone today? Let's start off with that question. Good. <laughs> it's sunny, so can't complain. Right? The weather has been so nice recently. And yesterday as well. I was so happy that the weather was really good. Yeah. It's, uh, it's nice to see it start getting closer to summer now. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's spring. There's hope. We can do it. <laughs> okay. Um, yep. So let's just start off now. Uh, we'll, we'll try to, you know, uh, keep it within the hour of 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Katarzyna Plechner, but I go by Kat, and I'm the vice president of the Neuroscience Society. And today I'll be uh, hosting the panel. Uh, and um, I think it's best if I would like to ask our guests to introduce themselves, um, starting with uh, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think everyone probably knows me. I'm Sarah McComish. Uh, I'm a postdoc at GCIN in Maeve Caldwell's lab. I um, actually have been at Trinity for <laughs> basically the last 10 years. I did my undergrad in physiology and then my PhD in physiology as well. And I'm still here. <laughs> Um, and then I think, Kat, you were interested in uh, why we're interested in sustainability. Um, so I guess we all kind of were brought up with recycling, etc. But it's only in recent, probably the last year or two that you, I really realised that we need to do a lot more than just our recycling at home. Um, and I have to say, uh, my friend Camilla, uh, who we also all know, uh, was a big positive influence in that. Um, and obviously then when the Green Lab initiative was initiated in TCIN, I very much wanted to get involved with that. So um, joined the committee. Perfect, yeah. Oshin? Uh, yeah, so uh, hi, I'm uh, Oshin Joyce. I'm a PhD student uh, in Anya Kelly's lab uh, in my second year at the moment. And um, I guess kind of, uh, kind of similar to Sarah, I kind of got interest in, the whole kind of green lab um, initiative when the initial emails were kind of sent out looking for lab representatives and kind of, I guess, at home kind of trying to, you know, rethink the way like things have always been done at home in terms of, you know, recycling, waste management. As soon as I kind of heard that there was the possibility to also apply that in a lab setting, um, it kind of, I got very interested in that and uh, uh, became part of the, the green labs committee and kind of been working on it ever since. Yeah, cool. Um, and Guillaume? Um, yeah, so my name is Guillaume. I'm a PhD student in Mani Ramaswamy's lab, uh, part of the School of Genetics, but in, based in TCIN. Um, so I'm in my second year, and I started being interested uh, in the whole Green Lab initiative, uh, thanks to Camilla, who she's in the same lab as me, so we talked quite a lot about it uh, when she was initiating it. And I thought it sounded like a great idea. The fact that I've always been interested in reducing carbon footprint at home makes just makes sense to try and apply that at work as well, um, considering how labs can be quite wasteful in general. Yeah. yeah. So um, thank you. So I was just wondering, how did the committee form and when did you guys started working on, on, on this whole project, um, Guillaume? Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, because it does, it does seem like ages ago, uh, but I think it was, we started in February, I think Camilla started looking into applying and stuff kind of uh, towards the end of the year 2019, and then the applications were sent out and stuff around the month of February, 
and then the committee was um, built. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, <laughs> around the month of March, I think. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you, uh, I remember. So you guys sent out the first sort of survey that went out um, about uh, my green lab and what was sort of going on in terms of sustainability. And what do you think were the major takeaways from that from that first survey, um, Sarah? Well, uh, it wasn't the easiest survey to fill out. Um, <laughs> was the first thing that struck me. I definitely did not know as much about TCIN and uh, sustainability in the lab as I thought I did um, ahead of filling out that survey. So there was a lot of I don't knows that I wasn't happy to be ticking them boxes, but unfortunately it was the truth. Uh, and I would say that that was probably the same with a lot of other people as well. We just really didn't know how things were run in TCIN outside of our media little lab group. Um, and that it's very important that we, we do uh, improve on that, hence the booklet. But perhaps the most striking thing for me, uh, which we got in the report was just cold storage and very simple changes that you can make with cold storage. Uh, can have a dramatic effect. Um, so there was little tidbits like that that we got in our feedback report that I thought was very interesting. Um, uh, so what are the, so can you elaborate a bit more on the, the cold storage? The example that jumps out to me is the uh, ultra low temperature freezers that uh, use the same energy as a house. And by up chilling the freezer from minus 80 to minus 70 can save, I think it was 20% of the energy 30. usage. 30? 30% very popular. Yeah. So wow. <laughs> quite significant. So did you, after that, after you learned that you just started going around and turning down all the freezers into, <laughs> into that temperature so or? <laughs> it's, it's a little bit more complicated than just up chilling all the freezers. Um, you have to be very conscious of what samples are stored in the freezer and there has actually been done uh, there's been quite a lot of research done on various types of samples to confirm that they can safely be stored at minus 70 as opposed to minus 80 or RNA and proteins uh, for example as well as tissue uh, is supposedly fine so it shouldn't be an issue but it's just getting permission from various lab groups a lot of those minus 80 freezers are actually shared among several lab groups uh, but one freezer has been chilled up already if I'm correct. That's really good. I mean it's it's, it's crazy to me that you can save that much energy and that the, the difference in temperature isn't something crazy. Um, so no, that's that's really interesting. And uh, Guillaume, what 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 stroke out to you the most after the first survey went out? Yeah, I have to agree with um, Sarah on that point. The fact that like I didn't know for so many of those questions, like all the aspects of like infrastructure, energy. I didn't know anything about like what kind of lights we have in TCIN and whatnot. Um, so I think that, yeah, that I, I think I share, share the same surprise there, Ms. Sarah. Yeah, I was reading the, the, the Green Lab booklet, obviously, and what I liked the fact was the uh, sort of very simple uh, plug load system that, um, you know, you have the, the kind of the color coded, uh, the green, the yellow, and then the red stickers. Um, so do you think that that is just something that sort of every lab can can do regardless of, of of what you're um of what you're working on and like how do you kind of make that decision um Oshin? yeah like um i think it is the fact that the whole concept of kind of the green labs in tcin especially is that it's you know it is a kind of collaboration and initiative amongst all the labs and not just like one in isolation so you know I guess implementation of the, the the sticker system is it kind of you know a good way to kind of start kind of the involvement and um, I think I remember like when I was doing a lot of the research you know like just you know labs themselves how kind of resource intensive they are you know they use about 10 times more energy um, than an office and um, so you know the use of you know, 
such a simple system, you know, could offset, um, you know, a lot of the, I guess, energy waste um, that might be uh, at TCIN. So. Yeah. So there's also, you also mentioned that 81% um, of all the lab equipment in TCIN is actually shared amongst other groups. And I was just wondering, is there um, sort of like, how is the, how are the, the samples and the contents of it? Is there a sort of accountability system or anything put in place where, um, you know, you can kind of make those decisions of, um, you know, having knowledge of what is where, and then that could potentially help it implement better uh, changes in, 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 in how labs are kind of run. Um, Sarah? Um, well, I think we're aiming um, to actually compile a list. I think a few of the labs have started it. Um, some of us might have an idea of what other lab groups have in terms of equipment, but it certainly think that compiling this list would be helpful. Now, apparently, Kieran has a list um, of all the equipment in TCIN, makes and models, so that if anything needs to be serviced, he knows what companies or what kind of what the specs are um for when putting those um I suppose requests through um but in terms of small lab bench top pieces of equipment um we're trying to catalog that uh, so a few of us have started haven't quite gotten around to typing it all up yet um so that is the plan and then that it will be in a shared folder somewhere so uh, it even might deter from some of the labs needing to buy brand new equipment when the lab next door has something as simple as a centrifuge or a vortex or weigh scales that or ph meter even something that's rarely used that he could just borrow it for all of 30 minutes and return it instead of having to buy brand new piece of equipment um but then there are communal rooms as well for some of the communal pieces of equipment uh, there's a small room on the fourth floor in TCIN with the PCR machine and uh, then the rig for your uh, developing your Western blots and gels. Um, so that is clearly communal. Um, but there are other rooms where there is TCIN equipment and it's just housed in one of the labs. For example, in AirLab, the cryostat is there and it's TCIN's mm -hmm. piece of equipment. It's for everyone. It just happens to be in Air Lab space. Yeah. No, that, that's a that's that's a that's a really good initiative, but it must be quite time time consuming. Um, so, and I think you're right. Is that like another aspect that that strikes me is the also the financial side of uh, of making your lab more sustainable. Um, so, sort of if you got if you could elaborate on that, um, anyone just just kind of how making your lab sustainable can also. Um, save you some money, you know? Well, just two examples. Well, for one thing, for example, like increasing the temperature in the ultra low temperature, ultra low temperature freezers that would decrease the amount of energy used. So in the long run, it would help um, decrease the expenditures. But another example is just switching, for example. So in our lab, we were using uh, pre-racked tips and recently we've decided to move on to bulk tips, which are a lot cheaper. They might be a bit more time consuming and annoying to fill, but you know, that's what PhDs and undergrads are for. But yeah, like the, uh, they are a lot cheaper. So I think a lot of these switches, I would tend to imagine that they would save up quite a lot of money. I don't know what Sarah and Oshin think. I'd, I'd agree with you on that like um even i know uh in uh, in the cali lab anyway like we decided to um you know upgrade a lot of our uh, like the freezers and the fridges that we had in our lab to more kind of you know energy uh like higher energy rating uh, models and you know took a, a huge inventory and got rid of a lot of old stock in order to kind of you know be more efficient um at a lot of those things and you know there was talks as well maybe of you know introducing you know just a, a timer switch for uh, certain plugs or machines and just kind of doing like a, a daily inventory each day just to make sure that you know something isn't left on and you know haven't used it for a week and it's just kind of you know 
sapping all the energy away. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, and another aspect of resource management was to buy only what you need and use what you buy first before buying more. So you don't let things go out of date and waste them in that way. And you don't buy more than what you need, uh, even though sometimes companies have the, you know, if you bulk buy, it's it's cheaper, but it's not cheaper if you're not actually using it. Um, so that was another thing to be mindful of uh, when purchasing um, and managing your resources, which could save you money if you, you do that cleverly. Um, so yeah, I guess that kind of brings me up to do, to the next question. Um, do you think that uh, sort of, uh, I know that you are, that uh, with the TCI, there are uh, the TCI and Green Labs um, sort of representatives, um, but on a more kind of global scale, I really like the idea of just labs sort of all over the world having that sustainability in mind. Um, do you see this, uh, this job uh, of, of keeping the lab sustainable as, as sort of a part of, of everyone's work? Or do you believe that one person should be sort of designated to, to this particular task in terms of organizing the, the workflow? Um, Guillaume? I don't know if there'd be a whole job purposefully like just for that. I'd say maybe it falls into the role of a lab manager, just that a lab manager might be able to get like a, a course completed in having a sustainable lab and knowing what to do to manage the lab, order things in a way that enables the lab to be a bit more sustainable. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that though. Like uh, that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I think, I think, the lab manager and then everybody like it's everybody's responsibility it shouldn't just be the one person honestly yeah yeah and some of the changes though um if you're if you're going buying new pieces of equipment and you want them to be more energy efficient obviously that's going to be a decision that you're going to have to make with your pi and um, their grant money <laughs> uh, and then there are some changes that's actually building level so it involves get um what we have done uh getting involved at the level of the management of tcin mm. yeah um so camilla in the chat said that uh, some universities have uh you know, a role called the, the Green Lab Officer. So, I mean, that, that could kind of potentially be, because I mean, when, when I was reading the, your, the guide, it just struck me that it is um, sort of, you really are looking at research very holistically. You're not just kind of, okay, I am, you know, I do these kinds of experiments. These are the improvements that I can do to my own experiments, but kind of just looking at, you know, uh, improving changes at the level of the building is, is definitely, you know, a, a, a difficult task. And I have to say, um, Congratulations for, for coming up with that booklet because it's really good. It's really easy to read um, and it's really well laid out. So definitely congratulations on that. So uh, what is one piece of advice you would give to a neuroscientist that would like to make their lab sustainable? Like you have a just, you know, fresh, uh, like new batch of a neuroscientist setting up their own lab from the ground up what would you what advice would you give them um anyone i know it's a bit of a you know there's so much but so yeah it could be multiple piece of advice uh i'd probably just say you know like just your behaviors and your decision making first of all like you know you know if you're doing any preclinical work you know you have the three hours of reduction refinement replacement replacement in terms of animal work so you know getting any of the kind of you know undergrad postgrads in you know, at an early stage, if they're thinking of, you know, doing grant applications for any modules, like, you know, the incorporation of maybe, you know, a sustainability component, you know, might be a, a new way of, uh, of looking at things. Um, yeah, but just getting them to think of, you know, I guess, the small things, because it's not um, that the people themselves are like, you know, actively not being green or sustainable. It's more just, you know, kind of the lack of uh i guess initial outreach or awareness of certain you know i guess techniques or practices that might be wasteful but you know mightn't actually be aware of so i guess it's kind of trying to 
adopt a new kind of culture away from like you know follow the protocol and maybe actually question certain aspects of the protocol of oh how could we do this differently uh, in a more greener way yeah. yeah Sarah what do you think yeah god it's hard sometimes when you consider that you're set in your ways um but I guess you're at an advantage if you're starting from the ground up with a new lab um because you can put these practices in place from the get-go um so you can consider if you're going to need to equip the lab with a certain piece of equipment then you can buy the those pieces of equipment that have been uh, ethically and sustainably manufactured um, and that they have a really good energy rating, uh, that type of thing, or secondhand, um, if, if possible, even better, um, or not at all if another lab is already equipped and you're in a position to, to share that equipment. Um, it really does depend on what area of neuroscience you're working in. I know animals was mentioned um, I would be, I mainly do tissue culture. There is a lot of plastic waste from tissue culture. And that's just kind of, this is the way it's done at the moment. I would be very curious to research ways in which you could equip your tissue culture room um, with maybe more plasticware instead of more glassware, should I say, instead of plastic, um, which would certainly, I think, be easier when you're starting fresh. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah what do you think yeah i'd say probably when buying your first equipment always making sure that you're getting uh either something that's refurbished or always aiming to get the most energy saving equipment otherwise i'd say something that it's not a um, being a sustainable lab isn't something that just happens like you have to deal with it once and then forget about it it's something that kind of happen like it's it's constant and it can be quite a lot of work so maybe having some kind of so if ever I don't know you there is certain tasks that enable the lab to be more sustainable and you want you need to share those tasks around so making rota for example that's what I've been trying to do with the with our lab at the moment um, for example for fitting the pets so just making sure that you're constantly pushing uh, sustainability not just when you initiate your lab but also you know, having that constant aspect. Of yeah. So what I'm getting from you, from, from your response is that um, just sort of making that a part of, of your decision-making decision, decision -making process in a way, like something to keep in mind, uh, not just, you know, like you said, not just once, but kind of with decisions that you make, just, just have that in mind and, and constantly see whether something can be, you know, improved, which is a really good practice to have. So we have one question. Um, how does a green lab certificate could help someone in their application for a faculty position? So uh, some unis support reproducible and sustainable practice in research. Um, do you think there's a sort of advantage uh, in, in that case as well when you're applying for, for faculty positions? I don't know. I feel like it's going that way if it hasn't already. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure we, we've had this discussion about grant applications and that we, we figure that at some stage sustainability is going to be a new section in your grant applications uh, for research funding. Uh, so I certainly feel like it's, it's going that way, but I don't even know if it's something that's considered in an interview for a faculty position right now. It certainly could be something that you could bring up uh, trying to sell yourself um, to the institution that you're actually going to bring uh, good sustainable practices into the institution and encourage that. Um, it's going to be a big push in the next 10 years uh, to improve uh, sustainability at the college level. So I definitely think it'll become, um, probably become critical. Mm. What do you think, Oshi? Um, yeah, I kind of, I probably have to echo Sarah's sentiments like the currently um i wouldn't have much awareness that it would be you know uh you know i guess an encouraging factor it'd definitely be you know, a unique selling point but um yeah i think over the kind of next you know eight to ten years that kind of change and kind of i think it's kind of the culture change will probably bring about more of a i guess a necessity or you know highlight having a, a green lab certification or 
sustainable practices and um, kind of bring that to the fore a lot more. Um, so yeah, so definitely in the future. Yeah. I remember when I was in my undergrad, which was last year, um, basically, uh, we were organizing a conference um, and that was the last sort of conference pre-COVID times. And we decided that we were gonna make the conference uh, completely paperless and not have the lanyards. Cause you know, back in the day when actually conferences were happening in person, uh, you would get sort of your lanyard and everything and then just have the program and it all kind of just accumulates. So we, we did instead, we put up uh, QR codes everywhere so people could just access their uh, the program from their phone. And that was a very kind of simple change that, 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 that we chose to do that actually turned out to, you know, save a lot of paper, save a lot of plastic and also, you know, save us some money in the, in the, in the conference budget. So definitely, I think it's, it's going to be something that, that hopefully um, will not only become sort of common practice, but also, as you said, potentially a requirement in the next, uh, you know, in, in the next few years or, or decades. So just so kind of coming back to the more specific aspects of, um, of the guide. So when it comes to lab, lab equipment, um, cold storage is sort of the largest energy consumer. Um, what measures have been out in place in order to combat this? So uh, specifically here, I'd like to sort of highlight the International Freezer Challenge. If you could elaborate on that and uh, just talk a bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think TCN, we've, uh, Sarah might be able to confirm this. I know sort of um, the Ramaswamy lab is part of it, but I think we were going to try and do a whole institution-wide um, thing for the freezer challenge for us to take part of it. Um, so this means the challenge includes things like defrosting freezers that need to be defrosted, upchilling um, freezers that can be upchilled, uh, and then also removing old samples that can be removed. Um, and a lot, like the list of things that can be done for this challenge is very long. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure we were considering uh, signing up the entire institution for everybody to take part in this. Yeah, I had registered GCIN as the organization because you have the option of whether you're an individual lab, whether you're a company or uh, an organization. So I did register TCIN as an organization and then um, Manny's lab is registered separately as a lab group and any other labs that want to register separately and then we can link everyone together under the TCIN organization. Um, the good thing is, is that it counts everything that you've done freezer-wise since August of last year um, oh. through to June, June, June of July, this year, June, June or July, July yeah. of this year, yeah. um, which I'm happy about because I spent days defrosting our freezers last December and I get to include that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I haven't looked through the entirety of the survey, but with just anything that we do related to cold storage in the next while, we can note it down uh, and then fill it in and, and get our marks for it, see how we got in. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds really good. Also, um, in terms of recycling practices in, in TCIN, um, are you looking to how how is that kind of going right now? And is there any kind of changes you would like to see being implemented over sort of the next few months? Um, I know there's like kind of in the corridors anyway. There's the you know printer cartridge and battery recycling boxes, um, you know, and then there's either you know. The solvent waste, um, or the there's also the container take back scheme um, through Hazmat, um, and kind of throughout the rest of the building, you kind of have you know the general waste, paper recycle waste, um, and I know in the handbook then Sarah made a, a very uh, you know easy to interpret graphic of you know considering you know where you're if you have waste you know where it goes and the corresponding bin that it would go to. So um, I think those kind of simple things, but they're very effective, kind of will go a, a long way uh, over the next few months anyway. Yeah, I'm in the process, I was trying to look into um, styrofoam recycling. Obviously a lot of the 
um, deliveries that we receive. I know some companies are cutting down on it, um, but still a lot of deliveries come in some sort of styrofoam uh, packaging. Falcon tubes come in a styrofoam rack, uh, which I have stopped purchasing because they just build up but we're hoping to organize styrofoam recycling there is a company called waste matters which comes and collects and compresses uh styrofoam and then they reuse it in manufacturing yeah we need to get a little bit more information um and figure out how we're going to get them on campus just with level five the moment it's making it uh complicated but trying to discourage disposing of too much poly, uh, polystyrene or styrofoam at the moment because it is our intention to recycle that down the line and probably get some other schools or labs outside of TCIN on board while we're at it and um, get as much as possible recycled in one go. Yeah, no. That sounds, yeah, it is it is definitely going to, to it is, difficult to you know be able to go zero waste in in the lab especially when you you know when you're running many experiments and you just kind of need to to you can't reuse the same pipette for everything all the time you're just not good <laughs> no and definitely not in tissue culture either i mean you're constantly changing your pipette and your tips across wells i did realize that the wrapping for some of the um individually wrapped tissue culture pieces are recyclable the, the wrapping that the plates come in for example and um, because it's a harder plastic it's recycled uh, and then the other half of it is paper so i just separate the two there's still quite a lot of soft plastic wrapping with all of that as well which is not currently recyclable in ireland Except if you take it to uh, the station, the recycling plant, you can't just put it in the normal recycling bin. Um, so that might be something we could look into down the line on a larger scale. See if that would be something that we would hope that Trinity would take on down the line, a designated waste bin for soft plastic so mm -hmm. that, you know, it can go down its own recycling stream. Yeah. Another, sorry, um, another uh, another aspect in labs that causes quite a lot of waste are usually ice packs. And I've recently gone back, I had um, contacted Dukak and Sports Center if ever they were interested in maybe collecting, uh, if ever I could drop off some ice packs basically. And they were quite grateful. And in fact, they uh, got back to me and said, basically at the moment they don't have as much usage because of COVID, but once people get back into clubs and stuff, uh, they would, contact me again and I was thinking maybe sending an email around for TCIN to collect clean soft ice packs. I know they can kind of get a bit weird after in particular the very old ones if ever, once they get to after 10 years I'd say up on <laughs> collecting dust get a bit weird um, but if ever like we can give even maybe 20 percent a second life it's always that much. Yeah. That's actually a really interesting, you know, a really interesting question. It's like, how how has the pandemic impacted uh, the work that you guys are doing? And did you find it uh, more difficult to sort of, you know, implement some changes? And, and how has it affected your work in general? Well, our first committee meeting was on the 12th of March last year. And then the college goes later that day, which put a swift end to any progression we could have made in those few months. Um, hence the survey, the first survey was only taken then in, in August when we had, we had been back in TCIN for a few months at that stage and we were in a position to, to take the survey. So yeah, definitely has slowed things down. <laughs> Of the whole um, take back scheme, there's one of the companies that supposedly takes back takes back the um, tip boxes for the RNA and DNA free tips because obviously you have to buy them wrapped, uh, sterile, sterile and and wrapped for your PCR. Um, so there is a company that takes those boxes back under normal circumstances, but not now due to COVID. So that's something that we could potentially pursue once things are safe again. Yeah, hopefully very soon. 
hopefully. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it must have been, it, it makes sort of the, the guy in the world you guys are doing even more so impressive that it's done during a global health crisis. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, just kind of uh, another question that I was just thinking about would be reducing the number of animals that are used in, in sort of in neuroscience research. Um, do you believe that one day we will sort of no longer have any use for, for animal models in research? That one day, that day will come and your neuroscience will be free of, of any animal use. What do you think? Hard to say, I think at this point, yeah. maybe. I, I, I don't know, I personally would not, I don't know. I don't think so, maybe in, no, <laughs> sorry, I really don't know. You know. Mm. Yeah, well, I don't work with animals, but I'm pretty sure that in Ireland, the ethics is quite stringent on using the bare minimum of animals that you need for a study. Um, I don't know anyone who has gone through the ethical approval for that can probably attest to that. Um, but I personally don't work with animals. I can advocate for non-animal models, <laughs> human IPSC, for example, which is what I use. But again, um, IPSC and the, the cells that you derive from them and even though now you can make 3D models, which actually probably allows you to go from a, a 2D cell culture state into um, a mini brain organoid state and see how the cells play off each other and see how uh, a drug targeted to one cell type might affect the other cell types. Um, that might limit the number of animals you would need at an early stage of drug development, but you still eventually have to look at the whole organism for a lot of things. That, that's my that's my interpretation. That's my understanding. Maybe, I mean, like in, <laughs> it's a nice thought. <laughs> it's yeah. hard to picture it though. Yeah, I mean, it is sort of, uh there is uh, no bypassing it at a certain stage. You have to, you know, you have to be able to, to see how it works within, within a, a system that is, uh, that works as a whole, that has you know, all the components of it. So yeah, we can dream. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I think that will bring me to sort of the final question that I have prepared. And then also if anyone would like to ask a question, please send it in the chat. Um, what are, what do you hope that will sort of happen in the next year or so? Uh, we can fast forward to 2022, March 19th. Uh, obviously the pandemic is no longer a thing. We're all happy having pints in the sun, but what would you like to see happen in TCIN? Um, and just, you know, maybe sort of even update the, 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 the booklet that, you know, it's, it's such a, uh, common practice that does not even need to be stated. Well, I think we'll have Green Lab certification. <laughs> 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 um, the, the survey is in reopen today. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's, it's due due soon and um, so we would hope to retake the survey include um all the changes that we've made so far um but there's probably a lot of sustainable practices already in place in TCIN and people just didn't know about them and they will be included so we're very confident that we're in a position to get the, the green lab certification at this stage but obviously there's a lot of changes outlined in the booklet that we haven't made yet uh, they're just maybe on a larger scale so more time and organization is needed but we we'll hope to make them uh, as we go um, we do not want to get a uh, green lab certification and then just kind of be off the attitude okay we have it now we're done mm -hmm. uh, we do want to to keep the momentum uh, and then there is always the possibility of becoming recertified and potentially progressing through the different levels of certification uh, that are available um, 
but yeah I, I would hope that maybe the uh, styrofoam recycling is something that we're doing every three or four months as it builds up and that will become just a, a normal thing you you don't throw out your styrofoam anymore you set it aside because it's going to be recycled in a couple of weeks um, and that's some of the other um some of the other suggestions are also underway. Yeah, perfect. I personally would like to see at least 50% of the minus 80 freezers go up to minus 70. Yeah. That'd be a, a good one, one positive thing, I'd say, at least in 2020. Yeah, 2022, at least half, hopefully. Yeah. It's, I think there's around 10 freezers in the freezer room. So. Yeah, no, that would be really good. Ashim, what do you think? Yeah, like, um, I think, like, from the first one, I think we got, was it 44%? And um, there was, like, 33 researchers in total, I think, took the survey. So, um, you know, I think, like, getting 44% and, you know, even myself, like, when I was looking through the questions, not knowing a lot of the answers. So I think, like, with the booklet itself, you know, we'll have hopefully more researchers uh, involved in taking the test uh, for the recertification. And, you know, you know, I suppose with the kind of new knowledge provided and with the booklet, you know, I'd, you'd be hoping above 50, you know, percent, maybe, you know, you know close to 60 if it was, if, it, if, if that would be nice. But, um, but yeah, I think a lot of the practices that have been taken in place and all the kind of, I guess, advocacy that, you know, uh, Camilla and the, the rest of the kind of committee have done, you know, hopefully that will, I guess, um, kind of bring us forward over the next few months as well. Yeah. So um, we have a question in the chat of uh, how can DCIN raise awareness about the new sustainability guide and encourage everyone to read it prior to taking the Green Lab survey? Um, and then also the second part, how uh, do people in TCIN can get everyone to, to complete the survey? So how do you kind of maxim plan to maximize engagement with the survey? I'm how just gonna we? keep asking everyone, have they done it? <laughs> <laughs> As I pass them in the card or did you do the survey? <laughs> uh, reminder emails. Um, Maybe we can get uh, the TCIN Twitter to also send a reminder yeah there is a wrap uh, a rep for each lab group yeah. on the committee so it, it's basically going to be our responsibility to make sure that everyone in the lab group has filled in the survey um, and yeah. we won't know who has filled it in and who hasn't but we'll know how many responses have been given i think so we should know how many people are in tcin and then we can see how many have responded uh, as we go. I think we do have also have the option of deciding to extend the length of time that the survey is available if there's poor uptake or poor, um, uh, if people are busy in the next week or two and don't do it. So, he, sorry. yeah, go on, no, go on. Uh, I think, um, I don't know if it was one of the meetings previous, but I think like, you know, even if each lab rep, you know, even just assigning like 15 minutes to get everybody together and you know, do it at the same time over Zoom or something like that, you know, then just just try to get as much people to do it as possible, just setting aside an allocated uh, time slot or something uh, might help as well. We're also thinking of organizing maybe Q&A uh, sessions mm. for them to like complete the survey while somebody from the committee is available to answer any questions that they might have. Mm. Yeah, no, that'll be that'll be a really good idea. So, in terms of a time frame that you're looking at, so the second survey is out now. Um, when does it close, and when do you hear back about the results of it? I'm not exactly sure. I think two to three weeks. We had initially uh, decided to keep it open. That that would be typical. We see how we get on, I guess. Yeah, um, two weeks. I think. Mm. And if I remember from first time round, it was maybe two weeks later that we got the report. There, there wasn't yeah. a big delay on the end of my green lab analyzing the results of the survey. Yeah, no, that 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 is it. That's really good. 
Um, okay, so if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to send them in the chat. Um, I think from my part, you have answered all the questions that I had. So thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, no, I just, you know, kind of wanted to, as a personal thank you as someone who really does, uh, is really interested in, you know, in sustainability and what we can do on a, like, sort of personal level and then also in the sort of workplace in the lab, how we can make it greener. I just wanted to thank you guys so much for, for all the work that you're doing. It's really great. Um, so yeah, if we don't have any questions, uh, I think we can sort of uh, end it on here. Uh, we have recorded the uh, Zoom, so I'm gonna try and stop the recording now.